Um, good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues. Um, I am uh, very pleased to welcome you to this seminar, From Vision to Results, ADB's Development Effectiveness Toward 2030. I should say, by the way, my name is Scott Morris. I'm a vice president at the Asian Development Bank. Um, the theme of today's session underscores ADB's commitment to translating its ambitious aspirations set forth in Strategy 2030 into tangible outcomes and to continuously track, measure, report, and learn from comprehensive performance reviews to inform decision-making at the bank. With the world's biggest population and the largest share of CO2 emissions globally, what happens in this region has enormous impact at the global level. Asia and the Pacific's trajectory in meeting the Sustainable Development Goals will determine the world's success in achieving the 2020 the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. ADB Strategy 2030 has enabled ADB to be agile and responsive in the face of a rapidly shifting development landscape, notably responding to our clients' needs during the COVID-19 global pandemic. ADB has also made vast contributions to the SDGs in the region since they were adopted globally. However, the, global de the development landscape has changed dramatically since Strategy 2030 was set in 2018 and addressing these new and complex challenges requires the mobilization of resources at a scale never seen before. It requires us to do things differently. ADB is currently undergoing a midterm review of its strategy 2030 and responding to the global call for MDB evolution. It has been leading the way with an increased climate finance ambition and a set of operational and financial reforms, such as our new operating model, the capital adequacy framework review, and starting to define a new corporate results framework. Donors and ADB have also agreed to an ambitious new replenishment of the Asian Development Fund for Asia and the Pacific's poorest and most vulnerable developing member countries. During today's session, we will del delve into how ADB strategies and operations have supported DMCs in their sustainable development progress. We will highlight achievements, identify areas that require attention, and understand factors that may, undermine, that may determine future, future success. Beyond reflecting on past achievements set out in the annual development effectiveness review, today's session is also about charting a course for the future, one that is grounded in a clear understanding of where we are today and where we need to get to. It is about identifying opportunities based on successful, proven approaches that can show results and refining our strategies to ensure that we maximize the impact of our work. So with that introduction, um, let me say uh, that we are honored to have a distinguished panel, um, which I will introduce briefly. Um, Sao Latiti Maeva Bethanvai is the Chief Executive Offer Officer for the Ministry of Finance of Samoa, and is also Alternate Governor uh, for the ADB. Ramesh Subramaniam, is Director General and Chief of the Sectors Group at ADB. Uh, Manny Jimenez, uh, Director General of our Independent Evaluation Department. And Lu Shen uh, is our Director of the Results Management and Aid Effectiveness Division. So with the panel, we will explore the multifaceted dimensions of our work and the impact it has on the lives of millions across the region and explore opportunities to accelerate progress. We're gonna start uh, with a context setting presentation from Lu Shen on the key findings of the 2023 Development Effectiveness Review. Our annual review assesses ADB's performance toward achieving strategy 2030 based on the bank's corporate results framework. It is our management tool used to track and monitor ADB's progress in implementing its corporate strategy. Uh, following Lu Shen's presentation, we'll hear from our panelists and at the end, we will open the floor for questions uh, from all of you. Um, I invite each of you to actively engage in today's discussions, share your insights, and contribute uh, to the con collective endeavor of advancing the ADB's development effectiveness toward 2030. So let's begin. Uh, Lu Shen, over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, with a very distinct, distinguished panel, as you say, I will try to keep the context setting and the presentation um, uh, brief but succinct. So very happy to see everybody in the room and very happy to be back in Georgia where I used to 
handle quite a number of projects uh, when I was back in operations. So, um, yeah, so let's get on to the uh, first slide to really look back a little bit. Uh, as as um, Scott has kindly said, the development effectiveness review that we do, um, it's kind of both backward looking but also forward looking. So when we look back since 2015, uh, when the SDGs were developed, uh, if you look across the 17 SDGs, um, across people, planet, prosperity, and sustainable infrastructure, um, our uh, reporting tool and our corporate results framework has allowed us to really look at the outcomes um, that ADB has contributed in the region. I won't go into the details, but uh, as you can see, as an institution, we have a lot to be proud of, um, but this is also an indication that we also have a lot more to do in the future. Next slide. So over the past few years, uh, I think we can all agree that uh, due to global and geopolitical um, uncertainties, as well as the COVID-19 crisis, as well as um, the climate change that is at the, uh, the overarching uh, in impact across the world, there has been a lot of uh, backtracking and also just off track generally for, our, for those SDGs by 2030. Last year, we were in New York um, at the midpoint of the SDGs and, you know, uh, being there w was really gave me a sense that, you know, the reality is that we have a lot more to do. Um, so we are, uh, the region, uh, the Asia Pacific region is not on track to meet the targets under the SDGs. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, the climate change is, it is a compounding factor. Um, and for some of the regions, uh, uh, you know, DMCs or development, uh, developing member countries, the vulnerability is increasing. Um, so even though we have made some progress in terms of poverty alleviation, um, oftentimes because of these compounding crises, uh, social protection has becoming more glaring in terms of that coverage for the people in the region. Food security and nutrition, um, these are also very, very urgent issues for the, um, for the population. And, uh, and these are uh, mainly due to higher food prices, due to the broken supply chains, as well as the impact of climate change. And alas, but certainly not the least, uh, GHG emissions continue to increase. Um, and uh, Asia Pacific, as you well know, it's one of the most rapid urbanizing uh, regions in the world. And so uh, when you're compounding that with weather related events with uh, insufficient infrastructure, this has a lot of uh, different uh, implications for the region. Next slide. So now just kind of zoning in now and sort of introspection for ADB. Uh, every year we, we have this slide where we say, okay, what, what are some of the areas that we have done well? And then what are some of the areas that continues to improve, uh, continues to require, improve, uh, require improvement? And so I think for the reporting on what outcomes that we're, uh, we're looking at under the seven operational priorities, we are achieving strong results, and this is certainly for all the projects that has been completed uh, by ADB. Last year, we also had a record climate finance year, which, uh, you know, what it really demonstrates to me and our team is that, you know, ADB now really is owning the fact that we are the region's climate bank and really thinking about a lot of our projects and operations with that climate finance in place. Gender mainstreaming and operations, this has been an ongoing effort for the past uh, five to seven years. And um, I, I think it's uh, really something that we can learn a lot from about how to mainstream, all right? Um, things like gender into our operations. In our sovereign operations, um, we have seen a lot of uh, increase in share of financing for our health and education projects. And um, so these are important because uh, they are building blocks for a lot of the so uh, societies uh, around the region. And in our non-sovereign operations, um, we had a record number of transactions um, for non-sovereign uh, deals uh, uh, in, the, in the region. And we had a very, very, very steady, but also very uh, high level of long-term co-financing rate which means that we're working really well with our partners and bring them in, into our transactions. 
And last but certainly not the least, uh, expanding focus in frontier economies. And so these are usually uh, the, the countries where you know, we are playing a much more cat, uh, catalytic role in bringing in private sector financing and mobilization, which is something that will be um, very important going forward. Now, what requires improvement? Uh, I think this is one of the things that Manny and I, we talk about a lot for our completed operations, you know, the success rates of completer operations. It's something that we continue to work on, right? Uh, as you can well imagine, when you conceptualize a project, um, you know, many years uh, goes by before it's actually completed. And if you have ever worked in operations, you know that things going wrong is part of the bargain, right? So whatever you had conceptualized, it's probably never gonna happen the way that you wrote it. And so how do you actually manage the things during the process? I, I think this is something that is a continuous uh, work in progress for ADB, as well as other institutions. And so this is something that we'll continue to work on. Uh, performance out of um, public sector, uh, sector management, as well as uh, water and sanitation. So these are two of the sectors that we're paying a lot more attention to because they're important, they're, they're very influential, but we want to also make sure that they're done cor correctly. Concessional assistance pro uh, projects, uh, this is something, again, we are paying a lot of attention to um, due to some more challenges that the um, countries uh, these, that receive concessional finance really um, face. In terms of non-sovereign operations, um, you know, the share of operations as uh, ADB's overall operations. So we're trying to uh, introduce more private sector financing uh, throughout ADB's projects, and so how to integrate that into our uh, operations is something that we will be paying a lot of attention to. Um, develop, uh, the design and monitoring frameworks, uh, these are basically the uh, logical frameworks that we have for all of our projects to look at the outputs, the outcomes, the impact of a project. Uh, again, something that we are uh, paying a lot of attention to to make sure that we get it right as much as possible from the beginning. So now looking ahead, there's a lot of stuff that we're doing and um, I think Scott referred to some of these. Um, we are in the middle of our midterm review for strategy 2030 uh, with which we will then have a new corporate results framework um, to really uh, mirror the new uh, revised strategy. We also have the climate action plan that was approved last year and that will give us a roadmap for uh, climate actions uh, from 2023 to 2030. We also have a new operating model that was launched last year. And so this is really an opportunity for us to look at the ways that we uh, manage our operations, how to make it more uh, efficient and effective. Um, there's many, many other things that we're doing in terms of building our capacity and our knowledge sharing and knowledge dissemination. Um, so, uh, so these are some of the things that we're doing um, on, the, on, on that front. Uh, improved project quality, this goes back to the success rating, but because we know that a lot of the things happen when we have to do implementation, so how do we uh, improve project prepared, uh, readiness how do we uh, improve implementation? Um, these are all the kind of things that we're working on under the new operating model to, to, to really strengthen that effectiveness uh, of preparedness as well as implementation. Regional leadership, um, you know, operational, uh, operations-based partnerships. This is very, very important um, to facilitate the regional co cooperation. Cross-boundary challenges, and so we have a lot of global and regional public goods and um, challenges that we have to uh, collectively address uh, uh, in sub-regions within the Asia-Pacific, so these are the other fronts that we're working on. And last but certainly not the least, uh, increased lending fi financing and partnerships. Last, uh, yesterday we had the 14th replenishment of the ADF, um, very, very important tool for us and our DMCs. We also have uh, quite a bit of uh, capital adequacy reforms that are ongoing um, and, and certainly not, uh, last but not the least, uh, coordinate with multiple uh, donors through country platforms and climate action, which is fast becoming one of the priorities for us. So let me stop there and pass the floor back to 
Thank you, Scott. Great. Thank you, Lou. And that's a very uh, good kickoff uh, to the discussion. Um, so for the discussion, Sally, Tite, I want to start with you and, and say I'm particularly pleased you're on the panel um, because, you know, I, th I think it's fair to say this, the formal agenda around development effectiveness and, and how we measure our results, not just at the ADB, but in a, in a lot of the multilateral institutions, um, it's fair to say that when it, you know our donors, our non-borrowing members are not shy about expressing their views <laughs> about the way this should all look. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, it's the clients who are going to care most about our effectiveness. Um, so I think, um, uh, well, I can say from, from my own visit to Samoa, um, it, you are very clear on where you see both uh, the challenges and opportunities in your engagement with ADB. So I'm excited that uh, we have the t opportunity to hear in, in, in this setting your views on that. So let me just invite your thoughts on um, the challenges uh, Samoa faces uh, broadly in the meeting development goals, but also where you see uh, the relationship with ADB, specifically Asian Development Fund, as as the source of financing we, we provide to Samoa. Um, and, and tell us a bit about, you know, uh, where you see um, the ability of, of ADB to help address needs and, and, and to track uh, the progress of, of effectiveness around what we do uh, in Samoa. Okay. Well, thank you, um, Scott Morris, Vice President, for the um, introduction. Uh, honored to be part of this uh, esteemed panel. I'm um, conscious that I'm the only uh, DMC uh, member here, but um, as we discuss the complexities of uh, development, I think it's important to understand um, the context of small island states like Samoa. So Samoa is actually, if you haven't heard of Samoa, located in the heart of the vast uh, blue Pacific continent uh, with a population of 200,000 spread over four um, islands, so already you can see our small size and remoteness alone presents challenges. Um, just providing uh, some context, uh, we are in the process of preparing our third national voluntary report on implementation of our SDGs as part of the UN um, reporting mechanisms. Uh, Samoa was the first uh, SITS and Pacific member to produce this report in 2016 and the second report in 2020. So in terms of commitment, we are committed to imp implementing our uh, SDG goals. Um, but since uh, 2016, after the MDGs, um, our national plans, including our current uh, BDS, uh, has incorporated or localized the SDGs for effective implementation. And we've done this using a sector-wide approach through the 14 sectors of the economy. So against that background, the challenges that you're um, asking um, in terms of Samoa, what we're facing uh, in terms of meeting our development goals, there's many, many challenges. But uh, let me highlight three key challenges that I think have greatly, or I believe, have greatly slowed down the progression towards uh, achieving the SDGs in Samoa. The first one, very obvious, it's the impacts of climate change. And that's manifested in the frequency of disasters in the Pacific now, which actually pose a lot of uh, significant um, threats to the livelihoods of our people, to infrastructure, to ecosystems, and I think while we've shown um, resilience over time, it does not lessen the impact every time that someone was hit by a cyclone or an earthquake or a tsunami. Um, and the frequency of these um, disasters uh, definitely impact on our development going forward and implementation of the SDGs. One thing, um, our 2050 Pacific strategy does highlight that climate change impacts is the key challenge to regional development, but also individual country development. One thing is certain, and I'm quoting from our second voluntary report, while Samoa may have graduated from LDC to lower middle income country status, 
it will never graduate from being a seed. So the inherent vulnerabilities to natural disasters will continue to have an impact on our SDG um, implementations. The second um, challenge that I see or that I know um, has impacted on our SDG implementation is actually the socioeconomic impacts of uh, health crisis. So we may be uh, geographically isolated and remote, but we're definitely not immune to the health crisis. Uh, the impacts of COVID-19 were delayed, but it did impact us and we're still recovering from it. And for information, Samoa was actually hit by two, by two health crises in one financial year. We had the measles epidemic in late 2019, and then we went through the uh, COVID-19 pandemic in uh, early 2020. So certainly those um, after effects have and are impacting our implementation uh, progress of our national uh, development priorities um, as we have to redirect resources to address our emergency response. So to me, these health uh, emergencies definitely um, slow down progress of our um, SDG implementation, especially on improved social development outcomes. The third one, and probably, um, and perhaps the most important, is limited capacity. The issue of limited human resource capacity, both in numbers and in capabilities, is an ongoing concern for SITs like SAMO, especially when we're looking at project implementation. Uh, that's a major issue for us. But also data analysis and management. To prepare the voluntary reports, uh, to monitor and to keep track of uh, development progress, we have to have solid data. But the analysis, the capacity to also analyze data is a challenge to us. So while significant efforts and relative success have been achieved in integrating the SDGs into the sectors and our policies, more capacity building is needed across the board to ensure the sustainability, but also improvement in data analysis. So it can inform our development policies, but also our actions for accelerated progress. So there's definitely data gaps and uh, reporting lags as a result of limited capacity. So I've just gone through the three um, key challenges. There's many more, but those I think are the key ones um, that we know for sure will um, uh, impact on our delivery of SDG goals. Um, priorities. But how does the um, ADB um, help us in terms of addressing the challenges. We do need an integrated approach, and that's where ADB as a uh, development partner comes in. Um, we look at ADB as our um, key development partner in the region um, to provide those tailored solutions to our unique uh, challenges by leveraging ex experts. Um, I'm honored to meet the experts here and hearing about um, their views on SDGs and um, development um, progress, but also the resources. Uh, but more importantly, the partnerships, the partnerships with other uh, MDBs and other um, uh, funds that can uh, provide um, the support to enable us to accelerate our SDG implementation efforts. So specifically, I would say ADP um, can help us in terms of enhancing our climate resilience through investing in climate smart uh, infrastructure, strengthening our disaster risk management system, but also supporting the integration of climate consideration in the policy work we do, but also the projects that ADP provide or fund. And I think as the region's uh, climate change uh, bank, ADB should complement its infrastructure work or investments with continuous strengthening of the members' capacity to deal with the challenges triggered by climate change impacts. I think understanding ADB's procurement and safeguard requirements is also an area that requires enhancement. Uh, it's a continuous work that we need to, to um, that the bank, I think, needs to appreciate um, 
and perhaps introduce flexibility in the way they uh, implement their policies. Processing time is also um, contributing to um, delays in starts of project. And as I said, the limited capacity is something that ADP also has to take into consideration. Um, secondly, ADP, I think, can also help us in addressing our economic vulnerabilities by promoting inclusive and sustainable growth strategies. And we're talking here about diversifying our economy. So when we went through COVID um, and there was no tourism, no tourist arrival, so that really um, it's a clearing example of um, increased unemployment in the tourism sector because there were no tourist arrivals. So not only did it impact on our uh, foreign reserves in terms of receipts, but also on jobs that were lost uh, during that um, period. So we're still recovering from that. So that's one area ADB can look at to facilitate our efforts to ensure that we diversify the economy but also um, linked to that, improved access to finance for SMEs and enhanced skills development. Uh, at some point, you also need to redevelop the skills of our people to make sure they're able to adapt quickly in the faces of health emergencies. And then finally, I think um, ADP plays a critical role in tracking progress on development goals and ensuring accountability for results. I think the bank's role in promoting um, accountability and learning from past uh, lessons, it can enhance your, um, um, the impact and sustainability of your investments in Samoa and beyond. And I think that's something ADB is uh, doing well. So the challenges we face in meeting our development goals are complicated and complex but it requires commitment, I think, on our side and the bank side and the coordinated efforts of all our stakeholders so that together we can um, translate the vision into actions and results. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think you, number one, have given us a good list to work from beyond uh, this panel event. Um, so I, I think we can take back a lot of um, the feedback you've already offered. It, it's, very useful. I, I was uh, struck in particular by a couple of things. Um, one, I mean, coming back to the importance of, of our clients' voices in this is, is to recognize the country context matters and it's not all the same, even, even by region. I mean, Samoa's experience is not going to be identical um, to other Pacific Islands. So, um, you know, that represents a challenge as we try to address development effectiveness at, at a corporate level. Um, and, and, you know, th we have to figure out um, how best to uh, reflect uh, country context. Um, and then um, your, your point about capacity at the country level that, um, you know, while we, we will do a lot both for our own purposes corporately, but also uh, to help you ultimately, um, you, you want and need to have your own analytical capacity, in, including data generation, that, that really would be the underpinnings uh, for so much of what we do in our work. So I appreciate let, let me turn to you and, uh, and start by observing that, that you, you sit atop, um, I won't use the word empire, but that you have this array, you know, the, the, the sectors group. Um, so, you know, this really vast array of activities represented by sector. And I, you know, so I think it gives you this unique perspective on um, if we're talking about the SDGs as this broad agenda, and now, you know, um, ADB's stated commitment to be the region's climate bank and, and thinking about the nexus of, of, of those objectives, that all has to be translated through uh, the sectors. So um, I, I think it would be helpful if you could reflect on what exactly that looks like uh, 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 across the sector work. Um, and then uh, perhaps as, as an additional question, if we think about um, the nature of, of, of much of the climate agenda, particularly climate mitigation, um, and you know, which sits in this broader um, agenda around global public goods, regional public goods, that we recognize that Increasingly, many of our objectives are cross-border in nature. So, 
So how should we be thinking about uh, our effectiveness, not just country by country, but uh, from the standpoint of regional and even global impact. Um, so your thoughts here, uh, we would uh, most welcome. Thank you uh, so much, Scott. Um, first, uh, if you allow me a shameless point of publicity for ADB and particularly for our strategy and policy department, because some of the people in the audience may not know, ADB is among the uh, first IFIs, if not the first IFI, to come up with a scorecard. Uh, the traffic light system, um, which has been there for now uh, over 20 years or so. We all look at it with a lot of interest, and particularly those of us in the operations also look at it with a lot of trepidation. Because when scorecard, when your report card comes, you get good results, you get also not so good results. But at the same time, it's lessons learned in terms of what is it that uh, we, can, uh, we can do uh, better. Um, and, and um, you know, sitting between the management on the one hand and the independent evaluation and you have client sitting here, I'll try and address and also I'll cover some of the points that, uh, that you uh, highlighted. Um, the uh, uh, Lucian's presentation touched on the SDG challenges that we have. Uh, in fact, as we, uh, many of us would know, business as usual in terms of what we are doing at present, and we are only about five, six years away to be exact, uh, to 2030, business as usual is definitely not going to get us to meet the SDGs. In fact, actually, uh, as, as of what we see now, these goals will not be met even by 2060. So those of us who lived through the MDGs uh, uh, in, in 2005, uh, for a few countries in Asia and Pacific, we had put together MDG acceleration programs, uh, particularly Pakistan, Indonesia come to mind, but some of the other countries as well. But even, you know, that was a kind of a lost mile or a lost minute effort, uh, which, which did not uh, really help. Uh, but clearly we are where we are. Uh, so in that context, ADB's new operating model uh, certainly is quite timely. Lots and lots of challenges. Uh, you know, one institution alone is not going to uh, meet the challenges, but one of the shifts, shifts that we have, we have four shifts in the new operating model. Uh, one of them is partnership shift. Uh, how, what role can ADB as a multilateral institution play in collaboration with countries in collaboration with other development partners. Uh, also, those that are providing new solutions, knowledge solutions will play an immensely important uh, role. So in this context, what are we doing in the, uh, in the sectors set up in ADB? Uh, but obviously, you know, sectors are working in tandem with uh, the regional operations as well as those who are covering thematic priorities like uh, climate, gender, um, and, and digital, and, and so on. In the SDG space, uh, particularly given the concerns that we have, uh, our efforts over the last many years, but particularly over the last two years in the context of uh, preparing for the new operating model, what are the things, kind of the bread and butter type of things that we do, uh, and, and can we do them better in terms of project design? Because project quality was highlighted here when Lucian spoke. Uh, also in the parallel annual evaluation review that uh, Manny's independent evaluation department does, this comes out very uh, clearly. So can we do better diagnostics, better uh, background analysis, and also put in more resources for improving project quality at, pro uh, quality at um, entry? That's something we are focusing on. Two sectors that were mentioned uh, particularly, uh, well, in this, evaluate, in this um, review, but uh, there have been many reviews in the past. We've learned lessons about other sectors. Public sector management, where we have significant presence, and also water and urban services, two sectors that have not done well. Uh, so here, what is it that we can do better? What, what, what are we picking up? You mentioned about capacity constraints that you're facing. Uh, here in the new operating model, we brought all the human resources together in seven sectors of operation, which gives us uh, a lot of flexibility in terms of deploying resources, not, well, particularly for Pacific Island countries, given your capacity constraints, but also across the board, um, whether it's in Central and West Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, uh, and, and so on. Um, now, the, the, the talking about the shifts that ADB is going through under the new operating model, uh, climate change uh, is, is very, very critical. As you mentioned, existential threat for Pacific, 
as well as many parts of the region, we find that the climate and the private sector shift, the first two shifts in the new operating model, then going into solutions orientation. Countries, whether small, large, uh, you know, low-income, richer countries, they all want new and innovative solutions. Uh, I'm just coming from a panel next door on uh, e-mobility. Uh, you know, the region Asia and the Pacific accounts for uh, more than 95% of the e-vehicles globally, but that's not enough. In, in the context of what we are uh, facing. So what kind of new solutions will be needed? That is also a driver in the new operating model. I also wanted to touch uh, on, Scott, on um, the um, many of the problems that we are looking at are, are quite interdependent in nature. Like e-mobility that I mentioned, you talk about transport, you talk about energy, uh, skills, uh, a point that, uh, that you mentioned. Urban planning is very, very critical. And finally, all of this needs innovative uh, money, uh, sources of financing. Uh, transition finance is a, is a very important area. So one of the things that we are looking at in NORM and ADB, uh, which also, uh, although the planning has been there for the past about three years or so, uh, the last two annual evaluation reviews of IED and the DEFR in the last two years, clearly point out uh, to the need for picking up these intersectoral uh, priorities. So NOM, NOM gives us a very good opportunity. I'll mention a few areas that we are working on, which also I think one of the uh, six pillars that uh, Lou presented is on how do we prepare ourselves for this increased capital uh, or the headroom that we have because of the capital adequacy framework update. And most of these, almost all of these areas, we are working on about 20 different ideas. Almost all of these are at, at the intersection of climate shift and the private sector shift. And all of them will need significant amounts of enabling environment work, besides deeper diagnostics and getting a lot of data. And also the ability to uh, analyze the data is also going to be critical. Let me just mention a couple of them. Uh, transforming food systems in Asia, for instance. Uh, you know, food security or food insecurity has been a major concern. Now, short term, we address through counter-cyclical type of assistance and some short term social production type of assistance. But moving forward, yesterday we had a panel on, on uh, food security coordinated by IED. Uh, clearly, new solutions are going to be very, very critical in, in, in order to boost um, uh, particularly resilience and uh, adaptation. Maritime decarbonization is another area that we are looking at where uh, if we look at uh, the maritime sector, if it were to be treated as a country, it will be country number five in terms of global GHG emissions. Take health sector, uh, if that were to be treated as a country, that will be country number four in terms of global GHG emissions, over 5% of uh, global GHG emissions. So all these areas, and then there are many more. I mentioned 20. I won't be reading all the 20. But we are looking at these uh, using uh, the, uh, the benefits of the new operating model where the climate and the private sector solutions will be brought together. Uh, but what we need is continuing uh, investments in new technology, new solutions, and we need knowledge for ADB as well as for our uh, member countries. And finally, last point, Scott, you, uh, you asked about how do we uh, particularly facilitate, um, what kind of incentives could there be for um, cooperation between uh, countries, particularly when it comes to climate priorities. Clearly, when we are looking at regional and public goods, we have the well-known challenges, well-known uh, problems. But ADB, as, as many of you would know, uh, regional cooperation and integration has been in our DNA since our founding. So we have many regional cooperation programs in the Pacific Cooperation Program. Working across countries, how can, what is it that we can do to uh, increase awareness of, of the, uh, the challenges and the uh, issues, as well as opportunities that, uh, that uh, we are facing? But also, uh, countries need, as you mentioned, uh, you know, from Samoa's perspective, uh, you need capacity, but also you need financing. And, and even uh, you know, upper middle income countries are asking ADB for more concessional financing when it comes to uh, particularly addressing um, the global public goods uh, challenges. So that's something we are working closely with our strategy and policy department as part of the CAF update. What is it that we can do to um, well, mobilize concessional money, but also uh, how do we incentivize um, addressing the market failure issues 
by preparing quality projects. First of all, making a case for investment interventions and then preparing quality projects. This is going to uh, you know, certainly take a lot of time and efforts. But the 20 ideas that I mentioned, they are at that intersection between uh, climate shift and hopefully investments will come uh, from the private sector as well. These are some of the things that we are working, but this is work in progress and it's going to be a lot of work ahead, Scott. Thank you very much, that's great. I think, and you've really brought to life from a programming perspective what the agenda really looks like and, and in many respects what are inherent challenges in you know the gr greater complexity of cross-sectoral uh, initiatives. Um, I think you've also projected a strong sense of self-scrutiny in, in the agenda around uh, uh, how we are ensuring effectiveness and in, in what we do. Um, now, we also have an independent function that, that, that applies that kind of scrutiny. So Manny, I, I'm going to turn to you and I think largely to ask you um, to provide your assessment of so much of what Ramesh outlined is, uh, uh, you know, your your job is is set up to be the, the to make you the mo the least popular perhaps uh, person in the bank. Fortunately, that's not the case at all. Uh, you're very popular, but you know, the the um, the independence of the function um, uh, is critical by design, and I I think it's particularly important in a public setting like this to hear from you on on what you see. Um, as the real challenges the institution faces um, around the development effectiveness agenda. So over to you. Wow, thanks. Yes, it's a lonely job, Scott. Um, uh, just for those of you who don't know, uh, independent evaluation is independent, not because we're not an ADB, but because we report directly to the board of directors and not to the president. Uh, so if Ramesh says he feels a little bit squeezed, it's because uh, both management and the board of directors directly are owners, um, put that squeeze on. Uh, if we were a private sector bank, we wouldn't need my department because the bottom line would be very simple. It would be financial returns. But we're promising economic development and poverty reduction and uh, alleviating the climate change. And the link between what we finance and those ultimate outcomes uh, has to be well justified and well evidenced. And that's why our department was created. And that's true of all the, the MDBs. You asked a very broad question, Scott, uh, on, uh, I mean, I think uh, Lou and, and Ramesh laid out very, very well and summarized uh, all the issues and challenges. And I, I'm very, I think that uh, you're absolutely right that the level of self-awareness in the ADB is very high. Uh, uh, that uh, we're aware of uh, what the constraints are as well as uh, what the gains have been. And our job is a little bit easier from that point of view uh, when there's that, that ownership. Um, so let me just reflect on some of the things that have been said uh, based on recent evaluations that we've done, uh, including uh, this annual evaluation review, which summarizes all of the evaluations that we've done uh, on ADB in the past year, uh, but also special evaluations, uh, such as on Strategy 2030, uh, on procurement and a number of things. And reflecting on both uh, what CEO uh, Saloa Titi uh, mentioned, as well as my colleagues, let me just uh, mention three things. Uh, one is, I think that... Uh, um, uh, the CEO and, and you, Scott, mentioned about the critical need for tailoring our uh, up strategies to the country context better. And that's something that's been consistently found in our evaluation. When we asked clients, uh, DMC clients, but also our own staff about where we can, where we can, do, uh, where we can do better. Uh, for example, uh, tend to be adhered a bit too closely to a set formula uh, of themes and cross-cutting sectors uh, as opposed to really looking at uh, what are the binding constraints in the country based on uh, good diagnostics. Uh, and that's an approach I think that uh, ADB is trying to address, uh, but it remains a, uh, a, a work in progress. Uh, one good example that we found recently is Vietnam, where that is beginning to happen. We're hoping that that can actually be repeated across a number of other settings. 
Uh, the second thing uh, uh, I'd like to talk about is uh, what you mentioned, CEO, uh, about uh, making life easier for you, <laughs> uh, for us to help you. Uh, I think uh, we did a procurement evaluation, and certainly uh, the challenge has been uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, are uh, stick to our main principle of what is the value addition of each procurement case, but at the same time ensuring that there's capacity in the countries to make that uh, judgment, not just on whether you're the least cost, but w whether you are adding the most value relative to that cost. And that's a harder thing to do. And uh, we think that that's a, a critical challenge uh, that needs to be done. Uh, the other way that we can make life easier for you, and I think you also mentioned that, is uh, being better partners with others who are trying to help. Uh, some of the times, uh, there are so many donors and MDBs we get in each other's way. Uh, and it, there's a very fine balance between partnership and competition. Uh, and uh, that's something that's sometimes not struck perfectly. And I think that's something that we can do better. And I do think that the ADB is trying very hard to work with like-minded donors uh, to, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, the third thing is, is what you mentioned uh, about building capacity. And I think both uh, you and uh, Ramesh and Lou also mentioned that this is a critical issue. Uh, it's uh, capacity to do any number of things, not just procurement. And, but also to ensure the policy work uh, is done well uh, that will actually set the uh, right context for investment decisions uh, to be made. Uh, that's a ch tough challenge uh, when you don't have the numbers in your favor, uh, but also uh, that you have a long history that has not helped uh, to, uh, to do that. I think that the, uh, what Ramesh mentioned about strengthening field presence is something that hopefully will help in the new operating model in which, uh, last I heard, I think there were a couple of hundred positions that were being planned to be shifted out of Manila to the field office. I don't know if I revealed anything that I shouldn't have, Ramesh, but you can correct me on this. Um, but I do think that that is a step in the, in, in the right direction. So let me just uh, mention those three things on really addressing uh, the country differentiation as well as possible, um, making life easier for our DMC partners, uh, and strengthening our field presence. Thank you, Manny, for, for highlighting those issues. And actually, you know, an example you used, I think, is around procurement is uh, these days a leading example of why we need both I, broadly why we need an evidence base, but particularly from an independent source as well as in our own tracking because, it, you know, it, it is an issue that it, that has been attracting a lot of scrutiny um, and it's important for us to be able to point to uh, evidence for what we do uh, rather than simple assertion about uh, the, the way things might be. So, so I appreciate that. So, Lou, I, I'm going to come back to you. Um, so you gave us an opening presentation, but um, Maybe if you could reflect more on the role you play in leading these formal efforts at, at tracking, basically, and um, uh, maybe uh, give us a sense of how you're looking at that formal set of processes for the future in terms of, of any, any updates or changes in it to sort of better take on all of this commentary that we've heard so far. Yeah, happy to share. And uh, this is actually one of the main tasks that's left for me this year is to develop the new corporate results framework that will run from 2025 to 2030. That covers the latter, latter half of strategy 2030. Now, scorecards, as Ramesh has indicated, can evoke fear sometimes, right? It keeps people accountable, right? It creates incentives, and that's one of the functions. The other function is really a reporting tool, right? We want to let our shareholders and all the interested parties to know how we're doing as an institution. And balancing those two uh, objectives can sometimes be difficult, right? How much do you report? What do you report on? Will this be something that is relevant and useful for the, for the readers, for the users, right? And so I think 
this has been something that has been occupying my mind um, for the past few months, and it will continue to occupy my mind. And I would like to share with you guys a little bit more about not so much what will be, but what are some of the thinking process, which I think would be more interesting for you. So at the highest level, um, I think as an institution, we want to know how much we're contributing to outcomes, development outcomes. And so that will remain. And so I think we are also one of the first uh, multilateral development banks to come to that outcome orientation and looking at long-term development outcomes. Right? And so this is interesting. This is very useful information and keeps us honest in some ways on what we're delivering right, at the outcome level. And so we'll continue to do that, but we'll do it with a lot more uh, streamlined um, notion of what w indicators we use and how many, right? Because when you have too many, it kind of loses its purpose. And so, um, but you don't want to have too few that you kind of lose like the essence of what we're trying to do in the development work world, which we know is complicated. Now, in terms of internal priorities and processes, I think some of the things that are challenging questions for me is when you're looking at metrics for for example, the country context, right? Development in the Pacific, it's a very different outlook, right? Than when we're thinking about South Asia, right? Measurement of success in the Pacific looks very different from those other, other regions in the Asia and the Pacific. How do we represent that at the corporate level? I think that's a really big question, right? And how do you aggregate or disaggregate what, what do you look for and what are some of the met indicators that will cover or serve the purpose? I think that's something I think a lot about. How to really focus on priorities, right? And so are we a climate bank, right? Um, the new operating model, we have, you know, the climate shift, we have the private sector development shift. Two very, very important areas, even though we know as a development institution, we do a lot more than that but do we cover everything under the corporate results framework or do we focus on those priorities? That's something that we think a lot about. Now, in terms of key processes, right? We talked a lot about project readiness. We talk about, I talked a lot about implementation because part of me feels like that's actually what development is all about is, you know, after you do a project, you implement it. That's where you get the most satisfaction, but it's also the most complicated. How do you incentivize people to pay more attention to implementation, right, rather than just uh, preparing projects. I think that's something that I'm trying to think about incentives. How do you create incentives for people to pay attention to implementation, right? Um, now, there's also a lot of things that we're doing in terms of internal, as an organization, are we adopting to new technologies, right? With the chat GPT being in our, on our collective minds, I mean, I think about this a lot, right? Are we using technology to the extent that, you know, we should? How fast can we actually integrate that into our, uh, ourselves as, as part of our DNA, right? And how do you measure that? The other thing that's hard to measure is knowledge, which is in incredibly important, but incredibly difficult to find a indicator or metric that measures not the quantity of knowledge, but the quality of knowledge. How do you measure that? I mean, if you, any of you have great ideas, come and see me after this presentation because I find that to be really challenging, right? And so at the corporate level, how do you actually uh, find a way to measure that in an effective way and also to get people to think a lot more, um, I, I guess, you know, critically about that. Uh, so that's something that uh, really keeps me up at night a little bit. Decentralization, uh, you know, that's again being closer to our clients. What does that mean, right? How do we measure uh, the level of success? So these are the, the 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 kind of things that we're really considering and chewing over for the next corporate results framework. And um, but for me, it's very exciting times because I think this is a this is really an, an opportunity uh, for us to make a, a difference in terms of how we measure ourselves and um, how we represent ourselves to the outside world, so. Great, um, thank you for that, uh, Lou. And I, I'm going to, uh, we have a, f a few minutes. Uh, I'm gonna try to quickly take uh, just a few questions. 
I saw, I'm, I'm going to limit it to very quick three hands that I saw first, uh, and then just to, uh, allow for uh, a last round of comments from panel to answer uh, the questions how they see fit. So, well, actually, l let me start in the third row back here, and I'll m work my way across. Uh, so right here, please, and very, just very brief, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ujala Sarfraz, and I work uh, with uh, Sightsavers, an organization that works on eye health and disabilities. So um, I want to raise that the most recent SDG report flagged that data is insufficiently disaggregated to monitor progress for vulnerable groups. For instance, out of 10 SDG indicators that require disaggregation by disability status, data is available for only two of them. Uh, needless to say, this has caused a lot of uh, underreporting of challenges facing vulnerable populations in Asia Pacific. Um, I wonder how ADB can contribute in, in, in addressing this shortcoming and what is being done to ensure data is disaggregated not just by sex and gender, but also by other cl classifications, including disability. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, right here. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. My name is Andri Prastia. I'm from Senex Center Asia. We organizations mainly focus on climate finance and development. Uh, I think it's really important, for example, like on the 2030, it's really key trajectory for achieving or tackling a cl climate change. But the problem is like ADB in the sovereign project, for example, like in Pakistan. Good. Sorry, turn it into a question very quickly. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, in in, in a project, uh, sovereign project, for example, like in a Pakistan gas storage development system, it states that uh, the operational priorities, even though it's a gas development project, they state like it's tackling climate change, building climate disaster resilience and enhancing environmental sustainability. How can we effectively measure if we at the beginning, we kind of like really, really confusing to categorize a specific project that harm to the climate as part of like the effort of tackling climate. Would ADB change that kind of approach to categorize the project of the technical assistance related project on gas storage development plan systems and not categorize that as tackling climate change operational priorities. So that's really, that's my question. Okay, thank you very much. And, and right here, last very brief question. Uh, please, just to quite, uh, we're, we're at time. So just, if you have a, no question. Okay, so let's, let's turn to our, our panel, uh, either to address those two questions or, or any closing reflections you have. Um, so so let, let me start with you uh, and we'll go down, down the row. Okay, just uh, reflections on the question being asked. The issue of data, it's critical, as you mentioned, that um, we need to have um, the evidence to showcase that progress um, has been made and the SDGs have been achieved. And I think that's an issue for us in the Pacific is that having that capacity. And it's one of the areas that I feel um, ADP has the um, ability to help um, the Pacific to um, compile the data, analyze the data. Um, the partnership issue, it's critical also, I think, because um, given the time frame, SDG 17 is probably the most critical one. And to have that partnership with ADB, um, I do have um, um, something to say about it. Um, the partnership of ADB, you really have to focus on country context, country ownership country systems and being able to use um, that partnership to harmonize um, and coordinate our development partners so it's easier for the country and for DMCs to also um, provide that data required to actually uh, keep track of progress, not just uh, from the client side, but also in terms of results and uh, what the bank is doing to help the countries in terms of their development. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Salatiti. Uh, Ramesh, please. Um, 
Well, I'll, I'll respond to the gas storage question on the data, probably Lucian, in terms of particularly how we are tracking. But on the disability, just a quick point, uh, under the new operating model, we have a dedicated social development group that has been set up. And disability is a critical area that we are focusing on. And part of that is also to strengthen efforts on data collection, as well as reporting, including building capacity uh, in our uh, DMCs. On the gas storage project, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, I'd like to discuss the details with you. This has been it was a TA done. The project was uh, we, we, our energy policy, which was approved by the board in 2021. Uh, it clearly stipulates what kind of investments that we can uh, put in place. Um, and on climate categorization, we also have a pretty stringent uh, process. So what has been done so far in the Pakistan context, it's actually technical assistance to provide advisory support uh, to the uh, country. Uh, under the new policy, uh, we uh, would not be financing, we, although we could finance in exceptional cases, uh, gas projects, uh, but you know that would not be the business as usual type of scenario. But having said that, any project that we do, even let us say we do a gas storage project, uh, we will still be looking for how can we help on uh, climate mitigation uh, and then particularly on resilience type of aspects, um, in, in, including particularly, for instance, uh, preventing disasters uh, and also providing advisory capacity to the uh, country. So the project classification may still have some climate uh, benefits, but that is more on, more on a proactive basis working with the client. But I'd, I'd like to chat more with you after the seminar. Thank you, Ramesh. Lou? Yeah, so thank you for the question about the disaggregation of data. This is something, uh, as many of you probably know, it's also not easy, right? And so in the past two years, we've been working very closely with our operational priority one team, which is on poverty and inclusion, right? And so we have been having a lot of deep dives on the dimensions of poverty, right? And so this is about disability. This is about multiple aspects of what we mean by poverty, what do we mean by inclusion, and how do we actually use the framework to define and collect data and then to monitor, right? So ginormous task, if you ask me, and it's also complicated, you know, uh, what kind of framework will be effective for an institution like ADB so that people will actually give you the data that you need, right? so that you can then eventually report on it. So again, just to let you know that this is something that we've been working on quite inten intensely with the uh, OP1 group, which is now the under the sector uh, complex. And so, and that work continues um, now and into the future. And so hopefully by the next corporate results framework, we can actually deliver something more in terms of that and how we measure. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Manny, you get the last word. Just on this ginormous task uh, on, on data, uh, I, I do think we're going to need help uh, from the outside. Uh, when the World Bank took on the disability agenda, I used to work there for 30 years, and that was 15 years ago. We had to bring people in because we didn't know. We couldn't have our ordinary economists who, did, who do poverty surveys just add a couple of more questions on disability. It, it, we didn't know what we didn't know. Uh, and uh, it took several years to actually hire people, many of whom were disabled, to actually tell us, how do you ask these questions? And so we're going to need help. So I hope that something that, uh, if it's going to be serious, will, will, will be done. Very good. Um, so let me just say, uh, if you want more of this kind of conversation, please stick around for the 430 session on MDB evolution. Uh, but we, we certainly can improve on the quality of the panel, so this was, this was great. Um, and, and please join me in, in thanking our panelists for the discussion today. Thank you.